The global political and economic order is changing very quickly. And one of the biggest shifts that we've seen in the past 20 years is in relations between China and Latin America. At the beginning of the 21st century, there was not a lot of trade between China and Latin America. But in the past two decades, their economic relations have grown deeper and deeper. Today, China is the second largest trading partner of the region. And there are nine countries in Latin America that actually trade more with China than any other nation. Those include the biggest economy in the region, Brazil, the third biggest, Argentina, and also one of the world's top lithium producers, Bolivia, one of the world's top copper producers, Peru, and Venezuela. Today, I'm going to be talking about the growing alliance between China and Venezuela. Now, Venezuela is a country that has been suffering under a brutal economic war waged by the United States. In 2019, the Donald Trump administration launched a coup attempt. Washington claimed a little known right wing opposition politician named Juan Guaido was the supposed interim president of the country despite the fact that he never participated in a presidential election, he never got a single vote in a presidential election. And the United States tried to pressure countries all around the world to recognize Guaido as the supposed leader of the country. And as part of this coup attempt, the United States imposed brutal sanctions on Venezuela, essentially trying to destroy its economy. You see, for 100 years, ever since oil was discovered in Venezuela, the country's economy has been extremely reliant on one industry, oil. This is a problem that predates the Bolivarian Revolution that was declared by the president, Hugo Chavez. Even before Hugo Chavez was born, the country has been a petrostate. For decades, the Venezuelan government relied on exporting oil to get revenue to fund social programs. This was the case even when the government was controlled by right-wing political parties. So the United States was trying to target Venezuela's oil industry to prevent the country from being able to produce oil, to cut off its exports to other countries around the world, to strangle the economy with the goal of destabilizing and eventually overthrowing the government. However, this policy failed. Still today, the president of Venezuela, Nicolas Maduro, is firmly in power. He continues the legacy of the Bolivarian Revolution that was initiated by his predecessor, Hugo Chavez, and he is deepening Venezuela's alliance with China. This September, President Maduro took a seven-day trip that the Venezuelan government and the Chinese government both described as historic. In Beijing, Maduro met with China's president, Xi Jinping, and they signed 31 comprehensive agreements that involve collaboration in many different areas, including economic integration and trade, geology and mining, health, technology transfer, house construction for public housing units, energy infrastructure, telecommunications, and even space. During Maduro's trip, she also announced that Venezuela and China are upgrading their diplomatic relationship. Previously, China considered its relations with Venezuela to be a comprehensive strategic partnership. But now China has boosted that to a, quote, all weather strategic partnership. That means that Venezuela is now considered by China to be one of its most important allies, putting it up at the level of Pakistan, which is one of China's neighbors and plays an important role in the Belt and Road Initiative, the global infrastructure project that Beijing is overseeing. In his remarks upon meeting with Maduro, President Xi said that, quote, China will continue to firmly support Venezuela's efforts to safeguard national sovereignty, dignity, and social stability, as well as its just cause against external interference. In these remarks, the Chinese government was very clearly criticizing the United States, 
for imposing unilateral sanctions and a blockade on Venezuela, which are illegal according to international law and have caused extreme economic suffering in the country. In fact, according to numerous independent experts, the illegal U.S. sanctions on Venezuela have caused tens of thousands, perhaps more than 100,000 civilian deaths in Venezuela. In the speeches that Venezuelan President Maduro gave in China, he repeatedly stressed that he considered this to be historic. Maduro said the growing relations between China and Venezuela are part of a, quote, new era. Maduro added that, quote, we have a relation of deep friendship, of successful cooperation. Our relations have been a model for the global South. Maduro also said that China has been the, quote, great motor of development in a new era of a multipolar and pluricentric world. After signing the 31 agreements with China, President Maduro also emphasized that the partnership between Venezuela and China is, quote, not about dominating countries, much less taking their resources or wealth. On the contrary, we are working for the development of industry, agriculture, technology, the capacity to make jobs and satisfy the needs of the peoples. It is the century of a different world, pluripolar and pluricentric. And they released a joint statement, in fact, condemning, quote, all forms of hegemonism and opposing all forms of unilateralism. China's newspaper Global Times, which is close to the government, described Maduro's trip stating, quote, the further consolidation and elevation of bilateral relations also suggests the irreversible momentum of South-South cooperation, which leads to win-win results and unity among the developing world rather than certain Western countries wrestling for power out of a hegemonic mindset. So they didn't single out any countries, but anyone who's reading between the lines can see clearly what they're referencing. They're referencing the United States and also the European Union, which constantly impose sanctions on countries, try to overthrow their governments, intervene, meddle, even invade. China and Venezuela are saying very clearly that they oppose these imperialist policies and are trying to build a new global political and economic architecture based on what China refers to as win-win cooperation, not exploitation, and certainly not war. In his speeches, Maduro also made it clear that Venezuela has applied to join the BRICS bloc, founded by Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. At a historic summit in Johannesburg this August, BRICS formally invited six countries to become new members, including Argentina, Ethiopia, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and Iran. China has publicly said that it supports Venezuela eventually becoming a member of BRICS. Brazil, by the way, President Lula has also made it clear that he supports Venezuela becoming a member of BRICS. And the fact that Iran is now joining shows that these countries in the global south are opposing the illegal unilateral sanctions imposed by the United States. This year, in fact, Iran also became a full member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is a very important institution for security policy in Eurasia. Members include China, Russia, India, Pakistan, and numerous Central Asian nations. And this also comes just a few months after China helped broker a historic peace breakthrough between Iran and Saudi Arabia. The United States for decades was trying to pressure Saudi Arabia, using it essentially as a proxy to wage a war against Iran, trying to destabilize the Iranian government. And now Iran and Saudi Arabia, they certainly aren't allies, but they have normal diplomatic relations, and they are now going to both be members of BRICS. So it is not an exaggeration to say that while the United States is waging war and destabilizing countries all around the world, trying to overthrow governments like in Iran and Venezuela and Russia, China is encouraging peace and diplomacy and stability 
and of course, economic development. And here, the question of natural resources is very important because of course, Venezuela has the world's largest oil reserves. Although I should point out, it's often not mentioned that Venezuela's oil, its crude oil is very heavy. What does that mean? You can't just take the oil out of the ground and put it in your vehicles and use it, right? You have to refine it, you have to process it. And Venezuela's crude is very heavy compared to much lighter crude in, for instance, Saudi Arabia, one of the world's leading oil producers. So Venezuela's oil needs a lot more processing. It needs to be diluted, mixed with chemicals like naphtha or lighter crude. But the U.S. sanctions on Venezuela have been aimed expressly at trying to prevent the country from importing the diluents it needs to dilute its oil. And again, this is part of Washington's strategy to intentionally destroy Venezuelan oil production to prevent the country from exporting oil to starve the government of revenue. And in fact, according to the top United Nations expert on sanctions, Special Rapporteur Alina Duhan, the U.S. sanctions resulted in Venezuela's government losing 99% of its revenue. So the United States has been imposing a kind of medieval siege on the Venezuelan economy. This goes back to Obama. This is a completely bipartisan policy. In 2015, the Obama administration absurdly declared Venezuela to be an extraordinary threat to the national security of the United States. The Obama White House used this as an excuse to declare numerous executive orders imposing sanctions on Venezuela. And when Donald Trump came in, he expanded that to a full on economic war and a coup attempt. Donald Trump brought in neoconservative war hawks like, for instance, Mike Pompeo, who was his CIA director turned secretary of state. And Donald Trump appointed as his national security advisor, one of the architects of the Iraq war, John Bolton, a notorious neocon. And in a separate video that I'll link to in the description below, I went through the memoir that John Bolton wrote in which he bragged about the attempt by the Trump administration to strangle Venezuela economically to destroy its economy. In fact, John Bolton even boasted on CNN that he had experience organizing coups like the failed coup attempt in Venezuela. Uh, one doesn't have to be brilliant to attempt a coup. Uh, I disagree with that. As somebody who has helped plan coup d'etat, yeah. not here, but, you know, other places, uh, it takes a lot of work. I, I do want to ask a follow up. Um, when we were talking about what is capable, what you need to do to be able to plan a coup. And you, you cited your expertise having planned coups. I'm not going to get into the specifics, but... Uh, Successful coups? Well, I wrote about Venezuela in, uh, in the book, and uh, it, it turned out not to be successful. Not that we had all that much to do with it, but I saw what it took for an opposition to try and overturn an illegally elected president, and they failed. The notion that Donald Trump was half as competent as the Venezuelan opposition is laughable. But I think there's another... I feel like you're this other stuff you're not telling me, though. I think I'm sure there is. So when you consider this very recent history as context, the growing partnership between China and Venezuela is even more significant because China is clearly sending a message to the United States that it does not tolerate this economic war. It does not tolerate this coup attempt. And in fact, China and Venezuela are going to deepen their economic relationship. For China, this is also a question of national security. China has the world's largest economy when you measure it at purchasing power parity, which is the best way to measure GDP, the size of an economy. And China is also the world's largest importer of both oil and gas. So what this means is that Beijing needs allies who are going to be steady and reliable providers of oil and gas and other commodities that it needs. China is, for instance, the largest purchaser of oil and gas from the Persian Gulf region, from countries like Saudi Arabia and the UAE. But historically, these countries have been very friendly with the West. And although now today they're trying to maintain a more non-aligned policy, balancing Russia and China against the West, 
Still, they're not necessarily super reliable. So China wants to make sure that it has a diverse array of energy partners. In this department, Venezuela is a natural ally. In addition to the large oil reserves in Venezuela, what's less known is that Venezuela also has very significant gas reserves. In the past few years, the Venezuelan government has been slowly expanding exploration to look for more gas fields. And in fact, BP reported in 2021 that Venezuela has larger proven gas reserves than Iraq, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates at 6.3 trillion cubic meters compared to just around six for Saudi Arabia and the UAE and 3.5 for Iraq. Now, I will add on a side note here that China does recognize that climate change is a very serious threat for the entire world and also for its own national security and its own economy. Beijing takes climate change very seriously. That's why actually, by the way, China is leading the world in the transition toward renewable energy. Bloomberg reported that China is on track this year in 2023 to install more solar panels in one year than the United States has ever installed in the history of solar panels. China has already installed more solar power capabilities than all of these countries combined. The United States, Japan, India, Germany, Australia, Spain, and South Korea. China makes up more than 80% of investment in clean energy manufacturing out of the entire world, four-fifths of the entire world. China represents 72% of the world's solar panel manufacturing. In fact, this year, China met its renewable energy goals for 2025 two years early, and non-fossil fuel energy sources make up 51% of its total installed electricity generation capacity. So China does take climate change very seriously and actually puts its money where its mouth is, unlike the United States, which constantly rhetorically talks about the need to fight climate change, but actually does very little materially to oppose climate change and to rein in its fossil fuel corporations. Despite the fact that the United States and other rich Western countries that colonize the global South have historically contributed the vast majority to climate change and carbon emissions in the atmosphere. So the reason I mention that is because you will hear Western governments criticize China because of its use of oil and gas. But the reality is that China has a population of 1.4 billion people. Its population is four times the US population. And China is still economically developing. It is a country that was partially colonized for a hundred years in the century of humiliation. It was invaded by numerous Western powers. Before its 1949 revolution, the life expectancy in China was around 35 years. Now it's around 78 years, which makes it higher than the life expectancy in the United States. China has lifted more than 800 million people out of poverty and continues moving forward, but its economic development is not done and you can't simply get off of fossil fuels overnight. China is taking the transition very seriously, but it understands that in the short to the medium term, it still needs reliable energy partners who can provide oil and gas Whereas, you know, decades in the future, its goal is to eventually no longer need oil and gas, which also, by the way, would be good for its own national security interests. But the point is, we're living in the real world and in the short term, China needs reliable energy partners. And among the most reliable potential energy partners is Venezuela. Venezuela's government is ruled by the United Socialist Party of Venezuela, which has a lot in common with the Communist Party of China. The Venezuelan government has been a victim of U.S. imperialism, clearly, unless it's overthrown in a coup, which hasn't worked so far. Venezuela is not going to ally with the United States. So clearly, China and Venezuela have a lot in common. They're natural allies. So obviously, this partnership between China and Venezuela makes perfect sense. One of the factors that has been really limiting for Venezuela in the past few years is that the Venezuelan oil industry was very heavily reliant on technology produced by U.S. and European companies. 
Washington sanctions have prevented Venezuela from importing the machine parts and technology it needs to maintain its oil production, to fix broken machinery. So Venezuela has been increasing its energy partnership with allies like Russia and also Iran. Iran has been under Western sanctions since the revolution of 1979 and has been able to develop a lot of its own local indigenous oil technology and gas technology. And China also has a lot of experience with oil and gas production being such a large country. It doesn't have enough oil and gas to meet all of its domestic needs considering how massive the population is, but China does have some expertise. So by deepening its partnership with Venezuela, it's expected that China can help Venezuela in rebuilding its oil infrastructure and also in gas exploration. Now, I mentioned that this growing partnership comes at a time when China has also been deepening its relations with Iran. And in fact, in 2021, China and Iran signed a 25 year agreement estimated at around $400 billion. Iran has agreed to provide China with oil and gas. And in return, China is going to invest in technological production, infrastructure development, and technical services to help grow the Iranian economy. And in fact, we saw an example of this this year. Iran signed an agreement with a state-owned Chinese company to help expand and modernize its international airport. And essentially, the agreement is a kind of barter system. So instead of using dollars or even currency, Iran is providing China with energy. And in return, China is building the infrastructure and providing the technical services. This is the kind of relationship that Venezuela is also looking for. Once again, it has been suffering economically under a U.S. blockade. And keep in mind that, again, this is these are economic problems in Venezuela that go back 100 years before Hugo Chavez was even born. So you, there's constant propaganda in the Western media blaming socialism and the Bolivarian Revolution for the economic crisis in Venezuela. But the reality is that this is a country that has been a petrostate for 100 years, and the Venezuelan government is looking for ways to diversify its economy. And in terms of President Maduro's trip to China, it was important symbolically that the Venezuelan leader arrived first not in Beijing, not even in Shanghai, but rather in Shenzhen. This is a major technological hub in China. It has been referred to as China's Silicon Valley, which I think is a bad description given how Silicon Valley is just a creation largely of the U.S. national security state closely linked to the Pentagon. But the point is that Shenzhen is a major technological center for China where a lot of technological innovation has been happening. And when Maduro was asked why he chose the city for the first stop of his trip, he said, quote, for those who are looking for development, technology and new inventions, Shenzhen is an important place. So it is a good starting point. In his comments, Maduro made it clear that Venezuela is looking for a technological partnership with China to help develop industry inside Venezuela to diversify its economy so it's not so reliant on oil and gas. Several of the agreements that China and Venezuela signed during Maduro's trip involve deepening economic relations and technology transfer. Venezuela wants Chinese investment and help in developing industry in the country. And by the way, I should point out this actually isn't a new policy. Even when Hugo Chavez was president back in 2009, Venezuela created a state owned phone factory in which Venezuela created very basic cell phones using parts from China. And the phones cost at that time $14. But technology has, of course, advanced light years since 2009. Those old phones are basically kind of historical artifacts at this point. And Venezuela was not able to keep up technologically with the development of new kinds of phones like China has been able to do, despite the Western sanctions on China, on companies like Huawei. So as China has been moving up the production chain with more advanced forms of production with higher value added, there is a possibility for many other countries, allies of China, to work with Chinese firms to, to try to develop their own technological capabilities 
And Venezuela is very interested in this. And Venezuela needs to diversify its economy. Venezuela has been looking for ways to diversify its economy. And by the way, speaking of Huawei, Maduro gave a speech in which he said, I have a Huawei phone, it's a great phone, and the United States can't use it to spy on me like the US made phones. <laughs> and on the subject of national security concerns for China, you can bet officials in Beijing have been watching very closely while the United States repeatedly has stolen Iranian oil shipments. Including this September, the United States illegally seized oil that Iran was sending to China. To justify this, Washington said that Tehran was violating its sanctions, but those are illegal unilateral sanctions. The United States cannot tell foreign countries like Iran and China that they're not able to trade with each other. The United States thinks it's the global dictator. It can tell everyone what, what to do, but the world is not controlled by Washington. And this is exactly why China, Iran, Venezuela, Russia, and other countries are deepening their relationship to end this hegemonic imperialist system in which the United States and other Western powers try to boss the entire world around, ordering countries, telling them what to do, taking their natural resources, stealing their foreign exchange reserves, and constantly violating international law while trying to replace that system of international law with a so-called rules-based order, which is never actually defined clearly because what it really means is a system in which Washington makes the rules and orders everyone around. So I think there's a lot of potential going forward for China's relations with Venezuela. It's part of China's growing relations with Latin America as a region especially with neighboring countries like Brazil, which has the largest economy in Latin America. China is already Brazil's largest trading partner. Brazil is a founding member of the BRIC system. And Brazil and China recently signed an agreement in which they're completely removing the dollar from their bilateral trade. And China is going to be importing Brazilian goods using the Brazilian real. And Brazil is going to be importing Chinese goods using the Chinese renminbi. So we're seeing more and more collaboration between Latin America and China. And as Beijing made it clear in its own diplomatic statements, this is part of a larger system of growing South-South cooperation. Venezuela may soon be invited to join the BRICS Plus system as well. And what we're seeing is, as President Maduro said, the creation of a new international architecture a political architecture, an economic architecture, part of a new multipolar world, a new era. And here at Geopolitical Economy Report, we will always be analyzing the most important developments in the construction of this new world. I'm Ben Norton, the editor-in-chief of Geopolitical Economy Report. Please subscribe on whatever platform you're watching or listening on. If you're on YouTube, please like the video and subscribe to our channel. It helps to promote our material in the algorithm. All of our videos are also available as a podcast. If you look up Geopolitical Economy Report, the podcast. And if you like the work that we do, please consider supporting us. We are completely independent. We have no institutional support. We have no big donors. We rely entirely on small donations from viewers and listeners like you. To donate, you can go to geopoliticaleconomy.com slash support. There are several ways you can support. The best way is you can become a patron over at patreon.com slash geopoliticaleconomy. I wanna thank everyone for joining me today. I'll see you next time.